Today we're going to talk about climate change. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about whether it's real or not. Uh, we're going to talk about CO2 a lot, hardiness zones. We'll go over some soil myths and then we'll do a little bit on uh, using water more efficiently. Global warming versus climate change. Are either of these real? Global warming, I think we've all pretty much agreed, and I, all I, I'm talking about scientists, uh, have agreed that, yeah, global warming is definitely happening. Uh, it's not so clear that we actually have climate change. And what I find kind of interesting is that 10, 15 years ago, everybody called it global warming. And then suddenly it switched over to climate change. And we're kind of interchanging these two terminologies and they mean something quite different. So uh, let's go through and have a look at some of this. So this is our global temperature. Uh, it's certainly going straight up and there aren't too many people that doubt that now. Uh, the question is still outstanding. What is the cause of this? And I know we're blaming ourselves for it and I'm sure we contribute to the problem. Uh, but there are also groups of scientists who are saying, look, this, the amount of CO2 we put in the air is actually quite small compared to some of the other factors. And some of the big factors are things that are happening with our sun, and it's just producing more heat, and that heat's traveling to Earth, and we're capturing it. So it's, it's a little less clear whether or not we're causing this. We're certainly not helping the problem. We are producing a lot of CO2. One of the reasons why this may still be discussed is that the amount of CO2 in the air is actually quite small. So it's like 0.04% is CO2. Uh, moisture levels in the air can be up to 4%. Right? So that's 100 times more. And water is also one of these gases that absorbs heat and does the same thing as CO2. Anyways, there's still debate about, but certainly global warming is happening. Now the next question is, well, is this global warming causing climate change? And the scientists really don't agree on this. I know that all the news outlets and all the online discussions, they're all talking about climate change and everything that happens is being blamed on climate change, but the experts aren't so sure. And the way we study this is we make models. You've probably heard that term before. Well, a model is just a very complicated formula. It's got many, many variables. And so you create the formula, you fill in the, the variables, some of which you know, uh, some of which you have really no idea about and you're sort of guessing, and then that produces a result. For climate change, there's uh, some like three to 500 of these models that have been developed. About 50 of them are considered reasonable ones. Uh, but when we try to analyze something, we actually take these equations, fill them in, see what the results are, and actually pick the ones that seem to fit what we're trying to produce, right? So we're actually selecting the models that give us the answers we want in some cases. So that's one of the reasons why there's still a lot of discussion here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and talk about both of these and see how that affects gardening. So here's a little map about storms. And you've probably heard it on the news. Storms are getting worse. There's more of them. They're more intense and so on. And this is a graph of actual uh, hurricanes in the U.S. And these are the the darker bars are the more severe hurricanes. And if you compare the last 10 years to the previous 10 years, you actually see that the previous 10 years were worse than what we have now, which is exactly the opposite of the impression you would get from news outlets. Now, if we draw bars on here over a longer period of time, they do seem to be trending upwards. But in the last 20 years, you'd have to say, well, they really haven't changed a lot. We don't have more severe hurricanes than we used to. In Canada, last year, we had terrible forest fires. Or did we? Forest fires are actually coming down. We have fewer forest fires now than we did 20, 25 years ago. They're in the news more, and some of them are larger and they last longer. But if you talk to forest experts, the big reason we have these forest fires are, A, we're building inside forests and we're living there, so... They cause more damage. And B, we're not managing the force that we have. We've essentially let them go for the last 50, 70 years, and we haven't managed them. And so they're building up all this dry organic matter. So when we do have a fire, it tends to be worse. It's not clear that we have more forest fires because of global warming. And in fact, the data suggests that's not happening. 
I only wanted to bring this up because we always assume that our CO2 is causing all these problems and they're real and we all agree they're real and so on. And that's simply not true. It's true in the news. It's not necessarily true in the science. So let's look at gardening and global warming. We have warming taking place, but again, it's not as extreme as people are thinking. So if we look at Southern Ontario, our hardiness zone really hasn't changed. We're a little warmer, but we're not warm enough to bump us up to the next zone. Uh, now, if we look at this out in Calgary, uh, they actually have gone up another zone. Uh, warming in Calgary and out west is more than here. What has changed is that we have less snow cover. And one of the things that that does is that plants can't survive as well. That snow cover protects our plants. And so we can have plants survive in a cold area better than in a warmer area because of the snow cover. The snow is like a blanket and it traps the heat in the soil. So in Guelph here, I have trouble growing some things that I know grow 200, 300 miles north of me. Even though it's much colder up there, they get a reliable snow cover. I see a lot of people discussing our global warming and the fact that we can grow more tender plants. And I think that's a big mistake. You have to remember that these numbers are averages over 20 to 30 years, depending on which system we're looking at. So what they say is that over the last 30 years, here's the low that we had. So we could very easily have two, three, five years in a row that don't reach that low. And then suddenly we'll hit it again. So it's the low over a period of time that's important, and that determines the hardiness of the plant. Interesting, the U.S. has just come out with a new hardiness zone map uh, about six months ago. Canada is promising to come out with one later this year, but they haven't announced a date. So I guess when that comes out, we'll see if our, our zones are, are any different. I'm going to guess that we haven't had a change in zone. And one reason for that is that zone change is a 10 degrees Fahrenheit jump. And we haven't seen that kind of warming. Okay? We're talking a couple of degrees, not 10 degrees. So I'd be very careful about moving to plants that uh, you haven't been able to grow before. The other thing that we're seeing is longer growing season. Our spring is starting sooner and our fall is ending later, and we have this essentially a longer, longer summer. And when I'm talking about, you know, summer, I'm talking about it from a gardener's perspective. You know, when is it warm enough to grow my tomatoes? That's the start of summer for me. So we do have this extended period. And one of the things that we can start doing is taking advantage of that and growing more fall crops. In our zone, it's always been difficult to really do a good fall season crop because it, that time period was just so short. You know, August is really hot, and then by October, November, it's really cold, and then so we had a two-month fall season. But that two-month fall season now is three, three and a half months, and so I think gardeners around here can start taking advantage of that, and we should look at growing more things in the fall. We also have to be very careful with planting in the spring. It seems as if our springs are starting sooner. Uh, if I think back to last year, we had a really great March. It was nice and warm and everybody was planting things inside. And then April came and we had a pretty miserable April. It was quite cold. And I know I had plants outside that I was really fearful of that they were going to get killed. The fact that we start earlier is, again, only part of the equation. We also have to know, you know, what is the last frost date? And it's interesting that, you know, when I grew up and when I was younger, our last frost date was always May 24th. Now they consider the last day of April as being our last frost date. But what that means is, again, it's an average. That does not mean that this year it won't actually happen in May. Right? It just means that this is an average over several years. It looks like our last frost date is the end of April. So I think we have to be very careful with sensitive plants when we plant them out. The other effect that this longer season has is it's kind of messing up our ornamental plants. So some plants are flowering sooner and others are flowering at the same time that they've always flowered. 
some plants now are able to flower twice. So we have an early crop of flowers and then they reflower later on. So the combination of plants is something else that we can look at and see how can we take advantage of this. And I think it's going to take quite a few years for us to actually understand what we can do here. Another issue that we're going to have is we're going to have more invasive plants. And I've sort of picked three here as examples. Uh, one is ticks. Now, we have a lot more ticks now than we used to. I think in part because the ticks are slowly migrating farther north. But a big part of that is the fact that they're now able to overwinter in Ontario, whereas in the past it's been too cold. And the cold has killed off those ticks, so they didn't make it through the winter. Uh, that's changed. Milder winters are allowing them to overwinter here. And so in spring we have more ticks hatching out. And so we're going to have larger tick population. That's just one example of a number of pests that are going to find it easier to overwinter here. And I think that as gardeners, we're going to see an increase in the number of pests we have just due to the warming effect from our climate. Now, of course, on top of that, we also are introducing a lot of new invasive pests as well. So that also makes the number go up. Uh, Miscanthus is an interesting plant. I've watched this plant uh, and it is a zone five garden. My Miscanthus never set seed. So they do flower really nicely. But before they can ever set seed, it gets cold and, and they just get stopped. Whereas in the Toronto area, some miscanthus have become quite weedy and they're spreading around with seeds. And in my garden, I've seen none of that. However, in the last couple of years, these flower heads are starting to mature and get very close to producing seeds. A little warming and suddenly this plant, which has been well behaved in my garden, suddenly becomes an invasive problem. And miscanthus can be quite weedy, depending on which ones you have. So there's a plant uh, five years ago, people were saying, oh, don't plant this, it's a really weedy plant. And I was saying, well, no, not in my garden, it's not a problem. And I, I grow some like 20, 25 different miscanthus. So I, I have a good cross section of them. But now I'm starting to get a little worried and I kind of keep a close eye on them. I may get to a point where we have to cut them down. The alternative, of course, is to plant miscanthus that don't set seed, that are sterile, and there's a number of those available now. Uh, the other plant I really like is the princess tree. This is really a, a kind of a woody tree, and here it, it doesn't survive the winter above ground, so it pretty much dies back to the ground every year. The roots are hardy here, so it regrows and it grows quite quickly. So you do get this tall tree-like structure and it has a nice big leaves, which make it kind of interesting. Uh, but this is an extremely invasive plant if we go down to zone eight. The root, part of the reason is that it flowers there, makes lots of seed and becomes invasive. And the other reason is that it's warm enough that it doesn't get killed back down to the ground. It really needs a couple years of, of tall growth above ground before it'll flower and we just never get that. Here. So this is another one of these trees that can become invasive here. We're going to have to be really careful of some of these. All right, well, what about CO2? We talk an awful lot about CO2. So what I want to do is go right back to the basics here, really understand what happens with carbon. And of course, CO2 is a big part of that story. Plants absorb CO2, they photosynthesize, they turn that into a whole range of compounds and they're all organic compounds and I'm using the term here to mean compounds that contain carbon and that's the chemical definition not the certified carbon definition. These are just compounds that contain carbon and, and most of the compounds in your body and inside a plant are organic molecules that contain this carbon. When the tree say dies or a limb falls off or they lose their leaves in the fall those organic compounds are dropped in the ground and we go through a decomposition process. So organisms come up, they start digesting that and they take some of that material into the soil where it continues to decompose. That decomposition process takes these large molecules that were made during photosynthesis and starts making them into smaller and smaller mo molecules. And a lot of that ends up as CO2. The CO2 is put back into the air and it cycles around. So you can see that although the plants are removing CO2 from the air, they also put it back into the air. So we have this large tree and when it dies and rots, all that carbon from that tree goes back into the air at some point, or almost all of 
a little bit of it stays in the soil. And it turns out that the soil is the one place where we can trap carbon for longer extended periods. And that's why the soil and the carbon in the soil becomes so important for global warming. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that if we take these trees and we go to a forest and we look at whether or not those forests are putting carbon into the soil, they're actually not if this is a mature forest. So if I take an open field with nothing growing there and I plant trees, well, those trees slowly absorb carbon and they grow. There's, there's wood produced and that wood is all carbon. And so for you know, 100, 200 years, this tree is living there and holding on to the carbon. But in a forest, that doesn't happen. In a forest, in fact, the amount of carbon absorbed by the vegetation is about the same as it produces. And there have been a few studies done to show that that's actually the case. So although it's important for us to maintain forests from a global warming perspective, uh, keeping those forests are not taking CO2 out of the air. They're just maintaining the level. If we're going to use trees to pull CO2 out of the air, the only way we can do that is to plant new ones. So this question comes up when we're composting, what happens to the CO2? Are we producing CO2 when we compost? And maybe we shouldn't be composting, right? We're trying not to produce CO2. What happens in a compost pile is exactly the same as what happens out in the wild. All we do when we compost is we just speed up the process. So out in the woods, the leaves fall to the ground. They're slowly decomposing. That takes years for that to happen. But eventually, most of that carbon is released back into the air. When we do it in a compost pile, we speed up that process. So we get finished compost in, let's call it three months, and then we use that finished compost. During that process, the microbes have come along and they've started to decompose that material and they are producing CO2. This process actually releases a lot of CO2. Now the material that's still there still has CO2 in it. And if we compare the pile before and after, we see that it's shrunken down a lot. Now there's two reasons for that. One is the fact that the material has been broken down into smaller and smaller pieces, and so it settles and compacts. But the other reason is that it's lost carbon. And carbon is a fairly heavy element. And as it goes into the air, you just lose it. So it, the whole pile shrinks. So now we take this material and we put it in our garden, which is great. We've put that carbon into our soil, but what happens? Well, the microbes continue digesting it. And as a general rule, compost takes about five years to decompose fully. And at the end of the five year period, a lot of that has, has been converted into CO2. So during the whole five year period, we're producing more and more CO2. Well, boy, this sounds like a really terrible thing. We shouldn't compost. But we have to look at the alternatives. And I think this is really important whenever we're talking about these environmental studies and environmental issues. We have to look at the whole picture. And what I see so much in social media and online and in news stations, you look at one little aspect and come to a conclusion. We have to look at the whole thing. What is the alternative? We have a pile of plant material. We have some leaves came down off the tree. If we don't compost them, what are the alternatives? One of the alternatives is we just leave them on the ground. Well, if we leave them on the ground, we've already said they eventually decompose. So leaving them there isn't any different than us composting it. It just changes the speed at which the CO2 comes out. Another option is the green bin. So we put them in the bin and we take them to the municipality and they do the composting. Now it turns out their composting facility is much more efficient than ours and they probably produce less CO2 during their process. The other nice thing is that in larger centers, uh, they'll capture any methane that's produced and use that as fuel. But we have to build in the other costs here. We have to look at the whole picture. So this green bin that you have sitting there, someone actually had to make that. There is an environmental cost, a CO2 cost for producing that. It's made from oil. It's got a lot of manufacturing. It's been shipped around the country. Then we put it on our lawns. Some truck comes along, that truck needs fuel, it produces CO2. We had to build the truck to pick up this green material. 
to take it to the facility. Once the compost is made, the facility has to get rid of it. So we have to truck it from there back out to some farm or some location to get rid of it. So when you add all that up, sending it to the green bin is, is not really a better option than keeping it on your property. In fact, I've told people for years, if it was up to me, no one would be allowed to put stuff in a green bin everybody would be forced into compost. It is better than green bending, but green bending is better than sending it to the dump. And the reason here is that in our compost pile, we're doing aerobic composting. We're adding air to that compost pile. The bacteria and the fungi that are living there are breathing air, they're aerobic. And when they do that, we produce CO2. When we take that same material and we take it to a dump and we cover it up with a lot of other stuff, we exclude the air and the micro population changes. They become anaerobic now. And when they're anaerobic, they produce methane instead of CO2. And methane is something like 20 to 30 times worse than CO2 for global warming, right? So it's much worse. So the last thing we want to do with this material is send it to the dump. We, we have to compost it somewhere else. So from a gardening perspective, does composting produce CO2? Yes, but it's probably the better option. How about CO2 in tilling? So the story all along has been that you really shouldn't till. And this goes both for gardeners and farmers. And the problem here is that we go through and we loosen that topsoil. We add a lot of air to the soil. The microbes use that air and digest the organic matter. So that lowers the organic matter in our soil. And the reason it lowers it, because it converts it to CO2. So tilling produces CO2. And we've thought that for, you know, 20, 30 years now. Well, it turns out we have some better research now. And in fact, this new research comes out of the University of Guelph. So originally what they did was they looked at the top six inches of soil and tilling reduces the amount of carbon in that top six inches. And we were pretty sure it's converted to CO2. So what the University of Guelph did was they looked at the next six inches below that, the six inch to the 12 inch level. And they found that tilling actually increases the amount of carbon there. So what tilling does is it doesn't actually change the amount of carbon, the amount of organic matter that's in soil. It just moves it deeper into the soil profile. What does that mean? It means that tilling is not as bad as we used to think from an, a global warming perspective. It's not producing a lot of CO2. Now, tilling still destroys soil structure, so it's not a good thing to do, but it's not as bad for the environment as we thought. And by the way, that does depend on the types of soil you have. And, uh, you know, sandy soil behaves different than heavy organic soil and so on. But for the type of soil we have in Ontario, that seems to be the story. So now let's ask another question. Is gardening climate friendly? And again, it's really important that we look at the whole cycle of this. Everything from what they call cradle to grave. Everything that's involved in that process. I mean, as gardeners, we think we're doing good things for the environment. Right? We're taking care of our pollinators. We're growing food. We're using that soil. Uh, we don't have lawns. We've converted the lawn into gardens, which are better than lawns and so on. We lots of talk about how great this is. We should all be gardeners. Well, there's a very recent study and it was actually just released a couple months ago. And they came to this conclusion, urban agriculture, which includes our gardening, uh, are six times more carbon intensive per serving of food than conventional farming. So they studied small gardens and looked at all of the things that go into it, all of the equipment you use, the way you use the soil, the inputs, the tools, the water, everything, and looked at how much food are you producing and how much carbon are you producing? And we find out that in fact, gardening is a terrible thing to do for the environment. From an environmental perspective, we are better not to garden. We're better off having large farms produce our food. And even if we have to ship it in from California, that adds less CO2 to the air than if we do it ourselves. I know a lot of gardeners aren't going to be happy with that. Now, of course, there are other benefits. You know, we get exercise, we get enjoyment, and, and so are there are social aspects to this that are worth considering. This study only looked at the effect on the climate.
it turns out that most of the carbon emissions that we create in this process of growing food has to do with our infrastructure, making raised beds, making sheds, building pathways, all of the things we do in our garden to support growing that food. And that's where all the CO2 is produced. Again, we have to look at the whole picture. When we make a raised bed and we go and buy a two by four, you know, that two by four was grown somewhere. It's processed. It's shipped around from place to place. Finally ends up at Home Depot. We go out and get it and bring it home and we saw it up and, and so on. And we have to drive there. All that adds CO2. So what is the solution here? What can we do as gardeners? Well, one thing we can do is stop driving places and buying stuff. And I've been advocating this for a number of years. Like we don't consider the driving and the buying of stuff when we consider the impact on the environment. So I have a couple here examples. Here's one that I've seen a number of years ago and, and I just thought was an absolutely silly idea. This is a little electronic gizmo that you stick in the soil and it measures how much sun you get. It's all electronic, it measures for 24 hours and tells you whether you're full sun, part sun, or full shade. And on my blog, gardenmist.com, I have a menu option for called something like useless products or products you shouldn't buy. And this is one of them. And I wrote a blog post on it and said, look, you don't need that. This is electronics. It's metal. It's plastic. You don't need it. Just look up at the sun and you'll know whether it's sunny. Well, this blog post got a lot of bad comments. People say, are you kidding me? I work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I don't have time to go out in my garden and look up and see if the sun's shining. It was quite amazing how negative some people felt about this probably they felt this was really necessary so then i wrote another blog post where i actually went through and calculated how long does it take for you to do this with a paper and pencil and how long does it take you to do this with one of these gizmos remember with a paper and pencil i can walk around the garden and kind of map out the whole thing at once if i'm going to use one of these gizmos i can only do one spot in 24 hours it's a product we really don't need. And there are many products like that. Uh, the one in the middle here is a weed barrier. It doesn't work in the garden, but we buy tons of that material. The top right-hand corner is mycorrhizal inoculants. That's just a representation of all of these input ingredients that we have. Bone meal, Epsom salts, all kinds of stuff we don't need in the soil. And yet we go out and buy it. And they all have to be manufactured. Another product I thought was kind of silly. This is a plastic square. It's one by one foot. And it helps you position the seeds so that the spacing between seeds is equally spaced. And I thought, my God, plants aren't that fussy. One in the bottom right I seen at a trade show years ago. And this is a square foot garden. So not only is the garden made out of plastic, uh, they've actually invented these crossbars that go across it, which are also plastic, so that you know exactly how big one square foot is. We need to buy less of this material. Many of the things that you can buy are simply not needed. What else can we do? If we increase the amount of organic matter in soil, we actually trap more carbon in that soil. We can do that by adding compost putting that compost into our garden, making sure none of this plant material leaves our garden, it stays there and gets incorporated in. That increases the amount of carbon in the soil and that adds a lot to taking CO2 out of the air. The second one on that list is a little surprising and that's to plant. It turns out when a plant grows, photosynthesizing, it's making all these chemicals, but anywhere from 20 to 40% of those chemicals are actually sent down to the roots and extruded out of the roots. Okay, they squeeze it out of the roots. And the reason they do that is they're feeding the microbes around the roots. The microbe population right next to the roots, what's called the rhizosphere, can have microbe populations that are a thousand times higher than anywhere else in the soil. The plant is taking carbon compounds and putting them into the soil and creating a kind of compost pile right around its roots and it's feeding those microbes. It's growing microbes. That's adding a tremendous amount of carbon to the soil. So simply by planting and keeping soil covered, we're adding organic matter to that soil. And the last thing I put on the list here is learn about myths. Learn about what actually works and what doesn't work. And guess what? I just happen to have a few myths here about soil management. Uh, so one is feeding plants. We talk about feeding plants all the time. 
Well, we don't feed plants. We have to stop thinking in these terms. What we really do is we replace missing nutrients in the soil. Now, these two terms sound like the same thing. It sounds a bit like just semantics. So we don't feed plants. We replace missing nutrients in soil. But they're vastly different. When gardeners think they feed plants, they have this want and desire to keep feeding them. They have to put something in the soil next to the plant to feed them. But if you look at it from the other perspective is that we replace missing nutrients, you have to ask yourself what nutrient is missing. And if you can't answer that, then don't add anything. Only add a missing nutrient when you know it's missing. That will cut down tremendously on the amount of fertilizer. Another myth is there's no such thing as plant-specific fertilizer. So here I've gone on the internet and I found some tomato food, some rose bloom, and some orchid food. But remember, we don't feed plants. There's no such thing as orchid food because we don't feed plants. We don't feed tomatoes. We don't feed orchids. The reason they're named that is because people look at it and they go, oh, well, I have to feed my tomatoes. I better buy some of this stuff. The other really important thing here, and I think this is one of the biggest myths in gardening, is that there's such a thing as plant-specific fertilizer. The one on the left there, that's for tomatoes, and the one in the middle is for your roses, and the one on the right is for your orchids. They don't exist, except in the minds of marketing people and the people who buy the products. There is no such thing as rose fertilizer. And I'm going to go through a little example to show you this. So I've gone to the internet and I just pulled off a bunch of rose fertilizer. And these are all produced by experts in the fertilizer industry who make material for roses. So if we look at the one on the top left, that's a 6, 12, 16. Ah, so what that means is that roses need a lot of potassium. That's that third number. But if we look at the one on the bottom right, it's a 4, 6, 2. Oh, so this expert says you don't need much potassium to grow roses. And if you look at these, they're all different. So how can they all be rose fertilizer when they all have different ratios of nutrients? Well, the answer is pretty clear. None of them are rose fertilizer. There's no such thing as rose fertilizer. These companies have just made up a formulation that they think you will like. I got some friends in here to help me with this demonstration. So here's a couple, the uh, very competitive gardeners. They both grow roses. So the lady went out and she got her soil tested and uh, her soil is low in nitrogen. So the gentleman, he got his soil tested too. And wow, he's got lots of nitrogen, but he needs potassium. So would these two gardeners use the same fertilizer to fertilize their roses? And the answer is no, you don't feed plants. The lady needs to add nitrogen because that's what's missing from her soil. And he needs to add potassium because that's what's missing from his soil. If we start thinking of this as adding the missing nutrients and only putting nutrients in when we need it and adding the right ones, we suddenly use a whole lot less fertilizer. So I grow on about six acres and I have over 3,000 different kinds of plants. I don't fertilize a thing. And I grow perennials, trees, shrubs, bulbs, you name it. I don't fertilize any of it. I don't fertilize when I plant, and I don't fertilize 10 years later. Now, in my vegetable garden, it's a little different because there I want things to grow fast, so I might use a little nitrogen there to speed things up. But in my ornamental bed, I don't. I also do things different in containers because, first of all, containers usually don't have soil in them, so it's a different kind of environment. And we water a lot, and so that water washes nutrients out. So containers, a lot of times, don't have enough nutrients, so it's a good idea to fertilize those as well. But the rest of the garden doesn't need fertilizer unless you have a problem. Here's another myth that I see a lot, and that is that synthetic fertilizer kills microbes. And this is completely not true. What happens if I take a banana peel and I drop it beside one of my plants? Absolutely nothing. That plant starves to death. Plants cannot use banana peel. Plants cannot use most of the organic material we use to fertilize our gardens. Manure, compost, fish emulsion, all these organic products, plants cannot use them. And the reason is that the nutrients in them are held in large molecules. And until decomposition takes place, those nutrients aren't released. So over time, this banana peel will feed my garden. 
you know, next year, the year after, and so on. But if my plant needs nutrients today, it's out of luck if I use a banana. I have to use synthetic fertilizer. The other really important point is that eventually this banana turns into molecules that are identical to what comes out of a fertilizer bag. The nitrate, the phosphate, the potassium are identical in a fertilizer bag and in a banana and in compost and in manure, they all end up producing exactly the same molecules. And only when those molecules are created can plants actually use them. So what happens when we take synthetic fertilizer and we put it on a field? Well, we get this happening. So we have this microbe population. It's pretty steady. Suddenly we've added the fertilizer. Fertilizer is microbe food. So they start growing. They start having a party. There's more and more of them. And at some point they peek out because they've used up all the fertilizer and then they come crashing down. For a little while they'll eat each other because that's food for them, but eventually they're back down to where they were. Synthetic fertilizer actually increases the number of microbes in the soil after we add it. Now I'm not saying that there aren't benefits for organic fertilizer, but this myth that synthetic is terrible and kills all our microbes is just completely wrong. All right, microbes are important, so how do we get them? Well, we can go out and buy them. And so I did this little study. I contacted five manufacturers of mycorrhizal fungi, and I asked them a very simple question. Can you send me the study that shows that your products work? I mean, all these companies make all kinds of claims on their website. Can you send me a study to show that your product works? Now, Root Rescue actually did send me a study, but it didn't match the claims they were making. It didn't show that trees actually grew better. It just showed that they didn't suffer quite as much from drought. But all the others were unable to show me any scientific data that they grow better. In fact, I just emailed today Promex, which I, I use their soil and they put microbes in there. And I wanted to see, well, how sensitive are they to temperature? And they have a big claim on their website. They're good for two years. So I said, okay, send me the study. Send me the the data that shows they're good for two years at extremes in temperature, which is what they claim. I just got the email 10 minutes before I started this program, and basically they don't have any research. Well, they have research, but it's not written up and it's not published. So basically they have no research. These products don't work. Uh, there's very little scientific evidence to use mycorrhizal fungi. And I've spoken to four researchers who study mycorrhizal fungi and asked them, should we use these in the garden? And the answer is no, there is very little benefit. There are very specific situations. There are some specific disease situations in agriculture. And these things probably work in situations where you have high drought. Okay? That's usually not your garden. It's easier just to water your garden. And the other thing you have to understand is that you've got millions of these things. So here's this other concept that we have to understand. Um, Microbes are always at capacity. And I, I demonstrate that with a stadium. So we have this football stadium here and it's full. Every seat is taken up, the big game. And another thousand people come in and want tickets. Well, they can't get in because there's no seats. The seats are all full. Soil is always at capacity. If you have crappy soil, you have a small stadium. You don't have many seats. If you have good soil, you have a big stadium. You've got lots of seats but it doesn't matter in both cases, you're at capacity. When you add new microbes to your soil, there is no place for them to live. There is no food for them to eat and they die off. This idea of adding microbes simply doesn't work. It's a small stadium. Okay, here's some numbers for you. Uh, these are the kind of microbes you have in one gram of soil, which is the weight of a paperclip, okay? You can have 100 million bacteria, that's in poor soil, fungi, a million of them. Think about it. This is a little speck of soil in the palm of your hands and you've got all these microbes. All you have to do is take care of the ones you have. You don't have to buy more. So we want to grow microbes. We don't want to buy them. We already have them. Let's grow them. How do you grow them? Well, one of the best ways is to put organic matter in. Organic matter is microbe food. If we increase the level of organic matter in our soils, we automatically get more microbes. And when we get more microbes, we get improved soil structure. We get an improved hold, holding of moisture. Um, what can we do about this? Well, we buy less stuff and ignore popular trends. Biochar is another one. Okay? 
There's some science that says it might work, and there's other science that says it doesn't. We can't even agree on what the definition of biochar is, so you have no idea what you're buying, but gardeners are now going out and buying this stuff. Just ignore these trends. We don't need them. All right, what about water? I think as we get uh, warming, we're going to have more and more water issues. And as the temperature of the earth warms, we get more evaporation. We lose water quicker from the soil. We get more water in the air, which means it comes down at some point, but it doesn't come down evenly. So some areas are going to be much wetter. Other areas are going to become very dry. Um, so what does our annual rainfall look like? Well, this is a chart that shows what it's looked like sort of historically from the 1900s to the present. It hasn't really changed a lot. So again, the news would make you think that this has changed tremendously. Now, right near the end there, there seems to be a slight increase, but in the next five years, that could come back down again. Um, this is not something that we can count on. But with global warming, we may get changes in the amount of rain in any particular spot. You think the global rain won't change a lot, but particular areas will. So what can we do about that? Well, number one is you want to keep as much rain on your property as you can. Try not to let it go to the city streets. The city has to clean that. It costs us money. Then you use the hose. You're using clean water, which costs us money. So keep it on your properties. One of the best ways to do that is with a rain garden. And rain gardens can be very simple. They're very essentially depressions in the ground. Uh, you plant things a little differently there so that if you get water for a day or two, um, they're not going to harm the plants. These are not ponds. The idea here is that the rain is there for a day or two after a rain event, and then it dries up just like your rest of the garden, but the water stays on your property. Whenever you use hardscape, use something that allows the rain to seep between the pieces, right? So uh, a driveway, a black top driveway is one of the worst things you can put in there. Put some stones or something instead. Uh, get organic matter into the soil because that holds water in the soil and then get some mulch on top of that because the mulch holds moisture in the soil. The mulch slowly decomposes, adds more organic matter, keeps the soil cooler, plant roots grow better. So the combination of mulch and organic matter is a secret for solving a lot of these problems. All right, uh, that's the end of the talk. A um, couple things here. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find me under the handle Garden Fundamentals. I have a YouTube channel with about 600 videos on it. I have a Facebook group. You're welcome to come and join. And we discuss all kinds of things gardening there. And the, the answers we are very scientifically based and we make sure they're correct. And then I've just recently started a podcast. So you can listen to a lot of this there. I'm happy to go and start the conversation. Okay. Um, thank you, Robert. That was awesome. Lots of learnings. Um, lots of learnings with that. So thank you. I, I wanted to weigh in on one particular piece of, and I've had 10 minutes to formulate this thought. So bear with me. I don't know that I thought it all the way through, but this is my gut reaction to one of the pieces that you shared tonight. And that is around this idea that uh, the cost comparison of buying in the grocery store versus growing. And, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to reveal something about myself as I formulate this theory. So I'm a shopper. I'm a spendaholic. Whatever you want to <laughs> classify it as, I'm going to find an excuse to spend money on something. And um, the money that's going into the garden is going there anyway, whether I grow food or not. That, that path is going down, that raised bed is going in, that statue is being bought. If I plant food, that is a secondary objective or a secondary thought. So I'm struggling with the idea that it's a direct comparison between buying food at the grocery store versus the costs associated with growing it in my backyard because that may not have been my primary objective anyway. And I'm going to build on that theory and I'm going to use an example from something that a project that we ran in town a couple of years ago. I really was angry about how the world was going to hell in a handbasket and what could we all do differently. So we, we had a community project where we tried to get people to do one thing, one positive horticultural change. So whether it was planting natives or removing invasives or planting a vegetable garden. What we found is that the majority of people jumped on the idea of a vegetable garden because it was an activity they could do with their kids. Mm. That's why they 
they did it. It was a family event. So, so I was starting to imagine that again, I'm wondering if this idea of growing food, the food part is the secondary benefit. It's, Hey, instead of going to the beach or the cottage or wonderland or all of those things combined, which has costs, we're going to plant tomatoes. So I, I want, I'm throwing that out there for, for well, your thoughts. Uh, first thing, when, when, when you say cost, you're talking money. I was talking CO2, right? So that study okay. looked at the effect of producing CO2 and comparing okay. a garden and, and how much CO2 it produces compared to a farm. Sorry. Right? It wasn't yeah, a dollar and sure. cent thing. Okay. And I it strictly was looking at that aspect. Which which one of those is, a, is better for the environment? Which one produces right. less CO2? Right. I mean, the I, argument for gardening, there's a lot of other arguments, right? You, you, like you say, if you're going to go out in a garden instead of, uh, you know, down, drive down to Niagara to go to marine land, well, yeah. that also has a CO2 footprint. You, pr you have to drive down there to get there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to compare those two. And we're humans, so we're going to do something. So in many ways, you can argue, well, gardening is, is not as bad as some other things we could be doing. Right. right, but I think we have to we have to understand that um, uh, gardening is it, from an environmental perspective. Um, gardening is maybe not as good as we thought it was. Okay, and the real take home message there is that we have to look at these things kind of holistically. We have to look at all aspects. You see, someone might have come along and said, "Look, I have I have soil in my raised bed, and I'm growing tomatoes, and I have no input costs, and you know I collect my seeds from last year, so I don't have to go to the store and buy them. How can that affect the CO2?" Well, you had to build the raised beds, and if you build the raised beds, you probably brought in some soil. That soil was trucked to you, right? Those are all costs. Yeah. And one thing we I, I notice is that a lot of times we pick one slice of this and we comment on it. And we don't look at it holistically, right? When we look at all of the inputs, you, you cannot sit there and say, well, it's better off for me to grow tomato than for me to buy a tomato from an environmental perspective, right? But there are other aspects to that where that you can argue and say, well, geez, you know, I'm going to do something that day and I might as well garden and I get exercise from it and I get better tasting tomatoes and I can get down the street and and so on. But I was looking at it strictly from an environmental perspective, right? I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you're saying about the, the, the impacts of gardening in general, whether it's food or your perennial gardening or, or yeah. whatever it is. That there's <clears throat> See, still. I mean, I can, I can make the argument that almost all gardening is a really bad idea. Yeah. Okay. If you left, if you left your house alone, you don't come outside and don't do anything, no gardening whatsoever, it will become a weedy, shrubby, mess from an environmental perspective that is probably the best option from an certainly from a co2 perspective that's the best option right but of Definitely. course we want to live in a nice place we want to use our backyard and so are these other aspects that come into it but strictly from a co2 perspective the best thing for us to do is to stop gardening right but then everybody has hobbies so if you stop gardening and you start going driving to the bowling alley to bowl you're still using CO2, right? You're going to do something. So you then have to balance those things out. That's great. That's that. Thanks for ending that on a, uh, yeah. a positive note. That was great. Thanks, Robert. And I think Amy has a question. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was just wondering, yeah, how, how letting your garden or your lawn go through natural succession could be better, which I mean, isn't an option, but like then having something that's just not lawn, you know, you've, gone to a plant a, a plant sale from a horticultural society and gotten some plants and planted them there instead of lawn that that must be like a perennial garden must be a positive uh carbon sink it it depends it, it kind of depends on how you do the gardening so if right now you're mowing your lawn and you're putting fertilizer on every year and you say okay we're going to stop that and we're going to turn our lawn into a perennial garden and we're going to go out and buy some perennials and plant them and we're not going to buy fertilizer anymore because we, Robert said, you don't need it. And we're not going to mow those perennials. Then that is a better option. But on the other hand, you have to remember that, and you did, you did sneak that in. You, you're going to buy those from a local gardener. So you're not buying commercial perennials, right? Because when you buy commercial pots of perennials, they're, they're grown somewhere in greenhouses and they have a CO2 
cost to them too. Um, but if we if we eliminate the lawnmower and we eliminate the watering of the lawn and we eliminate fertilizer, we're taking a step in the right direction, right? An even better step though is not to put in the perennial and just leave it. Nature will come along and fill it for you. It, it just won't look the way you want, but that's that's an even better option from an econo from an uh, ecological point of view. Thank you. And in fact, as far as lawns go, I don't think lawns are nearly as bad as everybody makes out to be. The The problem with lawns is that most people haven't learned how to take care of them. Okay, So uh, you don't need to fertilize your lawn. You don't need to cut it all the time either. You can leave it much longer. You can use an electric lawnmower or a manual lawnmower. You don't have to water it. I've never watered a lawn in like 50 years. Like, why would I? But other people do. Some people with lawns spend a lot of effort and cost and material to keep that lawn looking good. And so for them, the lawn is a really bad option to have around the house. In my case, it has weeds in there and I don't fertilize and I don't water it. And in the summer it's bone dry and goes brown and then that's okay. Um, I do I have to mow it. Um, my environmental cost for doing that is less than a lot of other lawns. And of course, years ago when we had a lot of pesticides and herbicides, then it was even worse because we were spreading those around as well. Any other questions for Robert? I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Hmm? My head's yeah. just died. Yeah. Um, Robert, you shared a stat that I missed, and it was a comparison between um, methane and CO2. You said methane yes. was so much worse Tw than carbon. Yeah, <laughs> I said 20 to 30 percent, and it... The number okay. kind of depends on how you want to define things. So I've seen numbers anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. But right. the, the, the key message is that methane is a lot worse yeah. than CO2. Um, and that's, for instance, one of the reasons you want to uh, make a compost pile correctly and you want to turn a compost pile once in a while because we don't want it going in anaerobic. Okay, If it doesn't get enough air in there, it will make methane too. But if we do composting correctly, then we'll get mostly CO2. Right? Thank you. But everything organic going to the dump will end up producing methane, which is yeah. really bad for the environment. Lots of learning. Any other questions for Robert? Well, thank you very much, Robert. I uh, really enjoyed that. And